Hello, my name is Ron Carpenter, and I offer you greetings. Do not touch that dial. Stay right where you are. Man, I'm excited about it. I, even the graphic, the new variant. I'm so tired of hearing about all these new breakouts. But you never hear anybody dreaming. You never hear anybody having vision. You never hear anybody speaking that tomorrow can be greater than the day. It's time for a breakout of faith. Take this journey with me. Hang on, and I'll see you in just a moment. John 17, for those of you who may not be as familiar with your Bible as others, John 17 is a prayer. Almost the whole chapter is Jesus praying. He's praying for those 12 disciples because he's about to leave. His assignment is almost complete. They've been with him three and a half years. He's told them everything that he wanted to tell them. And he's about to be crucified, be raised again, and ascend back and sit at the right hand of the Father, where the Bible says even right now he intercedes for you and me. So his prayer ministry never stops. He just continually intercedes. So when you pray, I don't know if you know how a high priest works, you pray and then Jesus takes it right on in, hallelujah, and goes to God the Father on your behalf. And the Bible says this thing we know, if we pray, he hears us, hallelujah. So I know when I pray, it doesn't fall on deaf ears and it doesn't hit the ceiling and bounce back. Do you know God hears your prayers, hallelujah? He's praying for his disciples. And look what he says. This is going to be challenging. There were some quiet people in that first service. Okay, I have given them your word and the world has hated them <clears throat> because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Ooh. He said, I have taken all this time and I have poured. I've told them how to love your enemies. I've told them that the meek shall inherit the earth. I've told them everything I know about faith that moves mountains and faith is a mustard seed. I've told them the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like. He said, I have given them your word. He said, and it separates them from the crowd. And let me tell you about people. They will hate on you and even mock you for your faith until they get in trouble. And you're the weird one on first, second, or third shift, and you're the weirdo, and you're the faith person, and you're the weirdo who takes your break, and you got your Bible sitting on the side of your table, and they mock you and make fun, but then let their wife get diagnosed with something. Let their son have to go to a rehab, and they'll come over there and say, you know, I know you, uh, you, you're a, you got this Bible. Will you talk to me a little bit and tell me a little bit about this? I've seen you kind of praying. Who are you praying to? Who are you talking to? And it's amazing. They'll hate you till they need you. Put the scripture back up if you would, sir. He said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. For those of you that are praying for Jesus to come back Wednesday, change your prayer. Jesus is not coming to take a weak people out of the earth who feel powerless to change their life. That's not why he, he's coming back. He's coming back for a victorious church, the Bible says, without spot or wrinkle. A people who are overcoming, a people who are not hiding in their church saying, please come get us. He said, I don't pray that you take them out, but I pray that you should keep them from the evil one. He said, don't snatch them out. He said, but incubate them. Incubate them. I've given them your word. And the world hates them because of it. So now what you've got to understand is, I know how bad everybody wants to blend. But you cannot comp compromise your effectiveness because of how badly you need a friend. And there are some people so relational needy, relationally needy, that they will compromise the difference 
the uniqueness that God has put on their life because they have to be needed by a particular group of people. And when you have to be needed by that group of people, you have to become like them to be accepted by them. And then you are salt that has lost its savor. So understand that he has put his word in them. And he says, because of his word being in them, it is going to make them stick out. It's going to make them be apart from the crowd. What he's saying is, ah, let me keep going. Keep them from the incubator. Don't let it get in them. Let them get in it. So can you affect it without it affecting you? Can I tell you something? The Bible says we are the salt of the earth. We are light in the darkness. We are a city set on a hill. You notice the things set on the hill. I love to ride through here and see the houses on the top of the mountain. And I'm like, how did they get that piece of land? I love that. You can't miss it. It stands out. It's different from the one in the subdivision. The lightness, all, the light always scatters the darkness. If you, help me, Jesus. If you are salt and God just gave you a new job and he sprinkles you in that department, if you're not different enough from it to change it, you are salt that has lost its savor. And the Bible says salt that has lost its savor is only good for the dung heap. In other words, God sprinkled you on it because you're supposed to be different enough from it to change it, to affect it. So you've got to understand being different is not bad. Jesus is praying for them because he knows the difficulty of being different. He said, I put something in them everybody else doesn't have, and it's going to be tough on them. And we got to understand that to stand out, sometimes you got to be tough. And being in step with God will take you out of step with people. Okay. Whoo. Hallelujah. Can I keep going? I'm still reading. We're still in our first text here. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Let me hit that one. That word world there don't mean planet. Doesn't mean earth. It's the Greek word cosmos, and it means systems, governing systems. And what he's saying is, the same systems that govern them do not govern us. We live out of a different place than they do. Our decisions come out of a different value system than their value system. What they chase, we don't chase. Our boundaries on our life are different than their boundaries. Our value system is different than their value system. We are not of that. We've got something in us that makes us not of that. The systems that rule them do not rule us. It may make them sick, but we can be healed from it. Come on, somebody. They may be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but we love our enemies. Come on, somebody. We forgive that we may be forgiven. We live life to a different drumbeat. Faith is not just believing for things. Your faith makes you stand out from a crowd when you live it. It's visible and it's seen. They're not of the world just as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify is not a word that says be religious and hyper holy and stand on your soapbox and look down your nose at everybody. The word sanctify means to separate. He said, so take your word or the truth. He said, and God do your thing. Take it and use it to make them different. Separate them from the crowd so they can affect the crowd. I cannot affect it if I am it. I cannot affect the conversation if my conversation is the same. I cannot affect the gossip if I'm gossiping. You're not saying nothing, hallelujah. I have to be different from it. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them. Verse 19, 
And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Lord, bless these next few minutes in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. I know I'm already 10 or 12 minutes into it, but let your neighbor say, here we go, here we go. You no longer are what country you hail from or what cultural distinctive you have. For we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we might show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And my allegiance, stay with me, and my allegiance to that nation supersedes every other allegiance. As believers, we're called to be together and not separated from each other. In this series, Ron Carpenter shows us the power of being in unity. It is our collective that is supposed to push darkness back out of our communities, out of our schools, come on, out of our cities, out of our regions. If anything's going to happen in this area, it's going to start in rooms like this one right here. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. You know what I used to think um, years ago when I would cut on the TV, all the wonderful voices that were on TV that so affected my life as a kid, you know, Oral Roberts and Billy Graham, and then as I got over, you know, older, the, the Copelands and the Bishop Jakeses and the, the Mike Murdochs and the Rod Parsleys, and the list goes on, who in my formative years helped teach me the word. And I used to just think that somebody gets in front of a camera and it happens. But it takes so much technology, it takes so much equipment, it takes so many highly skilled engineers and technicians, and it takes the purchasing of TV time, and it takes negotiators, and it takes fundraising. It is amazing what goes into it that I never knew. It was somewhat of a rude awakening when I entered this world. I don't know if you know how we do what we do, but we are not selling advertisements, we're not selling ads. We never broke to a commercial because we are totally and completely viewer and listener supported. And I want to give you an opportunity right now to join that. We, we, we're not satisfied. We have so many more things we want to do. We have so much of the world that needs to be reached. We've never had this many people coming to know Christ. We're between 450 and 600 a week that are coming to know Christ and people like you are helping make that possible. And heaven records that. If you've been giving, would you continue in your faithful giving? If you have not, but you've been blessed by this and you are struck by the same passion we are, would you consider becoming a monthly partner with this ministry? We want to give you this gift to say thank you for being a part of this wonderful family, but I also want to tell you we've got messages to translate it in. We've got people who've never heard it in their native tongue, and we have taken on that responsibility, and we want to do it all. We need your help. Would you consider it today? Thank you so much for your great generosity. Now, let's get back to the Word. I've tried several times to give y'all snapshots of, of my upbringing, but it, it is so foreign to the culture of the way people live here and the church culture here that, you know, sometimes when I just tell you, it seems just comical, and it is somewhat comical. But for those of you who, who've never been there, you know, I came up in the South. I was just a farm boy. And um, in the South, church culture is very thick. <laughs> it is not very thick here. But it is very thick. Let me, let me explain it to you. Here, what I've noticed about people is the first thing they ask you is your name. The next thing they ask you is what do you do? Y'all notice that? Where I come from, the first thing they ask you is what is your name? The second thing they ask you is what church do you go to? Because everybody goes to church. To be Southern is to be Christian. So there's been people who's been in church 50 years and aren't Christians. But they were taught to go to church. You can go get your hair done right now if you want to, but let me tell you something. You can't get it done anywhere where I came from on Sunday. The malls don't open up till church is over. They let us go home from football practice early to make it to Wednesday night Bible study. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, that's what I came from. And it was hyper-legalistic. This was the downside of it. A lot of the values were very good and very rich. 
The downside of it was hyper-rigid, legalistic. I didn't know what was right, but I knew everything that was wrong. Because, <laughs> buddy, they reminded you. And let me tell you something. They didn't get to cuss back there, so they would try to find a holy way to cuss. So they would tell you, you do that, you go into hell. They really just wanted to say hell because at no other time did they get to say the word. <laughs> they didn't tell you you were sinning. They were telling you going to hell. So everything, you know, I'm, you know, going to hell. So I finally, about my late teen years, I, I decided, you know, I can't keep all these rules. So if I'm going to hell, might as well go in a limo. Because <laughs> I couldn't do all this stuff. They used to have this altar call. They used to tell you to come to the altar and be sanctified. You remember that? Oh, come to the altar and be sanctified. You know, sanctification, being separated by God, it's a process. It lasts you all your life. God is continually growing you, maturing you, and sanctifying you. But they used to have this one-shot deal. And I proved the whole doctrine wrong just by myself. I went down there to that altar, and they said, when you get sanctified, you're not going to want to sin no more. That thing lasted about 40 seconds. And there were so many erroneous teachings, and there were so many things that when I finally, about age 20, opened the Bible one day for myself, and I thought, wow, about 80% of this stuff I was taught, <laughs> it ain't even in here. It's the traditions of me. I mean, this stuff that I live by, these rigid rules that were so binding uh, in their essence. You know, I live by them on an ongoing basis and then finally just gave up, but they never were in there. It's about a relationship with Jesus where you put your faith in him and then that faith becomes so real on the inside of you that out of your desire to walk with God and please God, you live out the principles of the word and then that distinguishes you because the blessing of the Lord is on you. The favor of the Lord is on you. He separated you apart to be salt, light, to be a city set on a hill. And we were taught that faith was how we get things. There's an element to that, a part of faith. But really, faith is something that is lived out and expressed in your everyday life. I want to walk in any restaurant. I want to pump gas. I want to go through Target or Walmart, even though I never go to Walmart. Hallelujah. And I want to stick out and be different. And I want people to say, I don't know what it is, but they say, Something different about that dude. And I want it to be not because of what I say, but because what I do and the way I treat people and doing right by people and being honest. Come on, somebody. This is how you live out your faith. We are not of the world. So we were also poor. We weren't poor. We were po. We didn't have enough money for the other O and the R. And they preached it as a virtue. So there was never incentive for the people of God to walk in any type of blessing. We struggled. Everybody struggled. And that struggle was celebrated as somehow a holy feature. I remember that most of the rules, unfortunately, were all slanted toward the women. Women couldn't cut their hair. Oh, yeah, I was raised in that church. They could not be on the stage with jewelry. You can imagine my wife did well in that church, can't you? <laughs> you couldn't wear makeup. We just celebrated ugly. <laughs> we was the ugliest people you'd ever seen in your life. When it said, do not love the world, throw it up again, I think verse 15, or the things in it, this was a proof text for us to never engage our world. They used it that if you ever did want to be blessed, you're worldly. If you enjoyed their results, if you enjoyed their culture, if you enjoyed their operas, if you enjoyed their concerts, if you drove their nice cars, if you lived in a nicer place, all these things, that was called worldly. So I had this definition of world, and then I start reading and studying the Bible for my own, and I see that that word for world is cosmos, which means systems. He's basically saying not that you can't have nice, live nice, and pursue goals 
and enjoy resorts and enjoy the coastline and enjoy grace. That's not what he's saying. He's saying don't be governed by the stuff that governs them. He said to live out of a different place. Let the decisions you make come from a different place. Let the things that push you forward, let them come from a different place. Let me go forward. Next verse. Yeah. Do not love. For all that is in the world. <laughs> so now, I've defined world and I found out that it wasn't that God wanted me to be ugly, boring, and never have anything. That's not what he was saying. He's saying, don't love the way the world functions. Because the world, the way they get ahead is by greed. He said, the way you get ahead is if you give, you'll get. You're not governed by what governs them. They're taught to claw your way to the top. You've been taught, humble yourself and I will exalt you in due season. Our rules are different. Our ways are different. Our methods are different. We live by a kingdom that is not of this world. So he says, don't love the way they function. And he says, now, let me define what world is. It's not earth. It's not a planet. Don't love what governs them because what governs them is three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. This is not of the Father, but is of the cosmos. He says, what's governing them out there comes from one of three places. Let me tell you something. Every sin you ever have or ever could commit, everything vile, carnal, and evil in the earth falls into one of those three categories. And Christians get hung up on details. God's not interested in details. He's interested in categories. And you know, Christians have hierarchy of sins. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You know, if you're a cheater, you're way up there. Because that's just, that's just the lust of the flesh. But they don't say nothing about gluttony. And that's lust of the flesh. It's not about details. It's about categories. I'm either chasing it because my eye wants it, I'm chasing it because my flesh wants it, or I'm chasing it because it strokes my ego. And he says, that is what drives the world. He says, you don't have world, you have word. So I operate according to different principles, a different value system, and I pull from a different place. Let me go to the next verse. And the world, man, I can't believe all my time's gone. And the world is passing away. What is the world? Governing systems. What's in it? Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Lust always has, always has a deadline. Love never fails. But if you're in a relationship because you just eat up with lust, there'll be a morning when you wake up and go, oh, I'm sick of you. Because everything that comes, the car that you had to have and your life would be perfect. And two years later, you find yourself on the internet looking at some other ones. Why? Because it passes away. That's why a drug addict can't do drugs one time. It passes away. He's got to go back to it. I am, it's so quiet in here right now. <laughs> he said, we're not that. He said, we're different than that. And it'll make you stand out and that's not a bad thing. And he said, if you're always chasing things from these three categories, he said it'll always be that contentment just kind of 
slips through your fingers like sand. And no matter what you thought would make you happy, you only strive to get there to find out you're no better than you were before you got it. All that is in the world, everything that's going on heinous out there, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And it is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God, good am I. <laughs> she got it. He who does the will of God abides forever. I think she set the tone. I think everybody in here needs to give God a praise right now. You know what? There was a woman that met Jesus at a well, and she was so empty. She was so depleted, and Jesus picked up on that. And he said these amazing words. He said, if you drink the water that I give, you'll never thirst again. When we don't know God, there's longings in our soul that never go away, and they drive us to horrible decision-making. But Jesus said, I come and I plug those holes. I come and I fill those empty spaces. And the reason nothing around you and no one around you can do it is because it's not an external problem. It's an internal problem. And only Jesus can deal with the human condition of the heart. I want to offer him to you now and his salvation. He died for your sins. He comes to live on the inside and bring peace and contentment. Your life can turn around on a dime with this one decision. The prayer goes like this. I thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> that you died for me and rose on the third day so that I could be saved to purchase my salvation. I'm sorry for my sins. I ask your forgiveness and I ask you to come live in me and be my Lord and Savior from this moment forward. I put my faith in you. Thank you that I am saved. And just like that, now watch this program, find you a great local church and we have it online on Sundays if you can't find one. But we want you to grow in this decision you just made. What an adventure is in store for you. God bless you. Until next time, we'll see you soon. You no longer are what country you hail from or what cultural distinctive you have. For we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we might show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And my allegiance, stay with me, and my allegiance to that nation supersedes every other allegiance. As believers, we're called to be together and not separated from each other. In this series, Ron Carpenter shows us the power of being in unity. It is our collective that is supposed to push darkness back out of our communities, out of our schools, come on, out of our cities, out of our regions. If anything's going to happen in this area, it's going to start in rooms like this one right here. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen.